What is going on, guys? Ricky in the Flip Lab here back with Anthony Pappas, one of my good friends. And we did a podcast uh, a little over a year ago about how you kind of got started in wholesaling land. And today, dude, I just want to talk a little bit more about like from uh, a year ago, what you were doing there to kind of what you're up to today. Absolutely. So uh, for so, for those people that haven't watched the first podcast, kind of give a little brief intro about really what you're specializing in the, the Phoenix market in okay. real estate. Absolutely. Uh, so started off a few years ago, wholesaling houses like a lot of people. And then I found land was more of my niche. I had a background in construction, so I understood the underwriting a little more than uh, your average wholesaler. Then started doing really well with the land stuff. Took that and started parking money into, you know, buying lots to flip lots and title lots, rezone lots. And now we're actually moving into a development play of a 10 unit apartment complex. So 10 units. Mm -hmm. That's that's a pretty big move. I've been wanting to possibly get into development and stuff like that. When did when did you kind of feel like it was like the right time to to make that pivot, or was it kind of one of those things where you're like, "Fuck it, the only way to grow is <laughs> just kind of jumping into it." So I actually uh, set a goal for myself as soon as I hit X amount of dollars liquid, I was going to go in and do a development play because my long term goal is to amass ten thousand units of apartments, and the best way to get there is build and buy. And um, so I figured I got to start building sometime. So what better time than now? Yeah. And when you w mean 10,000 units, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people, it's like, I have this many units. Right. It's like, do you actually own those units? Are you trying to syndicate that many? Like what's kind of um, down the road when you, when you say that 10,000 number, like how do you want to be involved in those deals? Uh, so yeah, definitely raise some private capital, create, create like a capital company and then just bring in uh, people kind of like, you know, Grant Cardone has done it. Um, some of the other big names like uh, MC companies out of Phoenix, same thing. Uh, that's Ken McElroy's company. That's what they do. They raise private capital, put it into their fund and then go buy multifamily with it. But you need a strong track record so people feel safe giving you their hard earned money. And so that's what I'm going to do. Build the 10 units, stabilize it, show how we did there use some of the money that we pull out of that, go buy another apartment complex, fix that one up, show that we stabilize that and start building that track record. Yeah, and I, I don't know if it's similar to like single family houses, but I always say if, if you're getting into like a new endeavor and you don't really know maybe all the ins and outs, exactly what you're doing, right. one of the safest ways to kind of mitigate that risk is finding a really good deal right. um, off the bat. Mm -hmm. So I know you, you know, you do a lot of wholesaling for land. So did you actually uh, come across this deal and it's just like a smoking deal and it just made sense of kind of like what I'm referring to where a lot has to go wrong for it to like really go south? Right. Right. Yeah. So the beautiful thing is a buddy of my old buddy of ours, Jesse Burrell, he owned this with his business partners, Annie and Evo, and they were going to build the 10 unit. So they already had done uh, the preliminary site plan and they had done all this stuff with the city. And they brought me in early on to try to help them with it because they were too busy growing batch to what it is now. So I got to see like you know, behind the scenes on this lot. And I got to see what the city was in favor of. So that built a lot of confidence because I saw under the hood, if you will, before buying it. So that built my confidence. Like, yeah, this is a good deal. Yeah. And, and under the hood, like that's where I sometimes think about, all right, I want to go build this thing. And then once I get into the deal, it's like, oh shit, I need to get this and this and all these right. extra costs, or it's going to take how long to do that? Right. Like, what did you kind of experience so far? Um, you know, just even before you even bought the the land? Uh, yeah, so we ran into some issues. There was an old structure that they had demoed on there. And I guess the demo company couldn't find the water meter. And so they just cut the water line and kinked it and stuffed it under the ground. <laughs> so the, the lot started flooding randomly. Is that where I saw the Instagram? I, I think I saw you like out there just digging, yeah, trying to find digging some water. In the rain, trying to figure out where yeah. this water was coming from. And we ended up finding the water line, tracked it all the way back to the meter that everybody said didn't exist and were able to shut it down. But just some issues, uh, homeless uh, people were, are, were, I guess that's not PC anymore. I'm Forget. Fuck it, dude. Yeah, yeah. They're they're on the streets. They're they're right. all up up in your lot with their shopping carts. Yeah. So they were building encampments. Um. So we had to go in and chop down all the trees so they had nowhere to hide behind and set up these camps. And it was right next to a school. The principal wasn't happy with the homeless situation because it was right around a bunch of elementary school kids. Yeah, that, so, made, that makes uh, sense. Had to pay to have a fence put up around the whole property, and you know, just the kind of stuff that you kind of learn on the fly. That. Yeah. yeah. What about like dealing with the city? The only cities I've dealt with really is like in New Jersey. Right. And I mean, just to like remove a fucking wall could, could take us six months. Right. Like what is it trying to develop, you know, on land and is it in Phoenix? Yeah. City of Phoenix? City of Phoenix. Um, same thing. A lot of, there's a lot of moving parts. The city's super backed up as is. 
So you're just, it's a waiting game. You get in the queue and wait and then just trying to navigate all the different departments. Thankfully, I have a great architect and engineer on board that kind of facilitating a lot of it. Yeah. And walk me kind of through what the numbers look like okay. on this deal. Obviously, we're not quite sure how it's going to finish, right? Like <laughs> yeah. a long ways down the road. But I mean, right now, even maybe something to like look back to see how close you were. Like, how do you envision this deal kind of playing out? Yeah. So the land basis on it right now, I'm all in for roughly 30K a door. So 300,000 all in as we sit. And that'll get me to permits. I'll have to spend, you know, a couple, uh, probably another 10, 15 grand in permits. And then after that, we're going to go vertical. Um, getting estimates right now of 150 to 180 per door to build. So we're hoping to end right up under 200 you know, thousand dollars per door or an all in of $2 million with the land into it. And then it should be worth roughly 225 to 250 super conservative because some of those units were also trading at 300 a door, you know, at the height of the market. Yeah. So, so you're kind of just, you, you were looking at other comps kind of in the area and then trying yeah. to like forecast, I guess, I mean, from, from the day that you bought it mm -hmm. um, to probably when you're looking at actually stabilizing the property, how long of a process do you think that's going to take, give or take? Uh, realistically, probably 18 to 24 months once we start building. And then the nice thing, once we stabilize it, we're shooting for around a seven to an eight cap, which is still hard to find in this market. Yeah, I hear m most like nice pretty nice like multifamily stuff here you're, you're looking at like what like four caps yeah a lot of four caps yeah, like super yeah. compressed yeah so I, I mean even if we end up in a six it's a still great asset great location and then um there's a few different plays we could turn it section eight uh do like a veteran assisted type living place or just go uh, traditional multifamily yeah. rentals yeah and, and do you see yourself um once it's stabilized just selling it off completely be, being part owner of it like right do, do you want to manage these properties at the end of the day <laughs> no definitely not that's a great question so we're going to stabilize the goal is to build so i'm going to take that exact same blueprint for that 10 unit and go stamp it on every lot i can find so it'll help me get through the permitting process a lot faster and then once i say get 100 doors of that the goal is to then sell that off as a portfolio and then move into the larger you know 100 unit stuff i see so so pretty much once you have that done and like you've already built it right. you're using the same probably crews and contractors mm -hmm. and, and general yeah. contractors um and then the city probably should have an easier time if like you already built something up in the city and right. it's stabilized for them to just kind of give you the green light to do that on similar lots in other parts of town. Absolutely, and that's the goal is to go to the city and say, hey, look, we proved that this one works. How can we fast track this through next time so it's not taking that long? It's gonna be the same exact plans, everything. It's gonna be the same site plan. So I'm looking for, if you're a wholesaler in Phoenix, 20,000 square foot lots to 30,000 square foot lots, R3 to R4 and R5. Wow. So yeah, you're building 10 units on just like 20, 30,000 lots, yeah. which you know, isn't that big. No, it's, it's, it's like less than a half acre. Yeah, it's pretty small lots, but if we get like the R5 density, we can squeeze it. Or um, if we're in the R3, we need a lot closer to almost a full acre. Yeah. And I think uh, well, what's intimidating for a lot of people that come across like land deals is they, they hear these terms like, like R5. Well, break that down like into simple form of really what does that mean? And when you come across like land deals, uh, how does someone know if this is going to be a good plot of land for Papa's to right. build a 10 unit on? So normally with, uh, so you have R3, R4, and R5 in Phoenix. R3 is your low density multifamily, you know, uh, and then R4 is going to be your medium and then R5 is your high. And then the way I kind of do a quick math on it is your R3 land, you're trying to get for six to seven, maybe $8 a square foot, depending on location. R4, you're going to be seven to nine. And then R5, you're 10 to 15, depending on the location. So that's like the quick, dirty math on it yeah. that we see. And then obviously if it's on market, it's going to trade a little higher, but that's kind of the range that we're buying in. Okay. And do you plan on, like, do you care if you're going direct to seller to find these lots or like you trying to buy from other wholesalers? Cause I know for a while there, you, you were pretty much just focused on like finding the deals. Is that right. still the case for you guys? Yeah, we're still finding a lot of it because a lot of people with the market shifting still think that it's 2021 prices where we're already seeing a quite a pullback in land. So it just doesn't make sense to pay retail when we can go find it for significantly cheaper. Yeah. I've been thinking too, like, um, when I see these, like, I see so many like, uh, land just like, you know, signs up there for lease, right. you know, uh, for, for sale or whatever. And they've been sitting now like driving around Gilbert Chandler for over a year mm -hmm. since I've lived in the area and nothing's going on with it. 
like what do you think these people that own these these plots of land like w what are they really trying to do if they're not developing on it they're they're sitting on it but it's in like uh, like the the land's already appreciated like right. everything around here is already popping right. and it's going like why haven't they made any moves on it whether it's developing or just selling it off so the the problem that i've seen most and this is not to disparage or talk bad about agent or brokers but they kind of comp land very differently than i look at it i try to reverse engineer if we build a property what's the build the cost to build what utilities what due diligence what feasibility period all the architect engineering fees and what profit do i need to make for this to make sense agents kind of look at what's sold in the area and get a price per square foot and then apply it to this lot sometimes taking into account zoning sometimes not sometimes taking into account utilities sometimes not so they look at it very differently they go to a seller and say hey i think we can get this number because this one over here sold for 1.4 we should get 1.4 for years but then from a builder's perspective we're like we can pay 700 max yeah so they get that number <laughs> in their mind that i should get 1.4 for this and then i have to come in and say it's not going to happen and then they say i'm not going to sell until i get my 1.4 number and then they'll just let it ride S similar to like the seller who had a realtor come in promise them oh you could probably get this for it and right. then they want a quick easy cash sale it's right. like all these guys are down here mm -hmm. and then like that seller just sits on the sideline for a while very much so and, and you get people that just own the land outright and it's kind of like their savings de deposit box but they're <laughs> yeah. just like hey if somebody gives me a million dollars i'll sell it otherwise i'm not going to sell it and they'll just hold on to it indefinitely yeah we've been talking to this one guy brandon's been talking to him um, and he owns this like big ass lot probably like the right. biggest lot left down in queen creek okay and he's just like He's just holding. He lives in like New yeah. York and yeah. I don't know, they, they just want to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. And that area has boomed in the last like few years. So you would have thought like when all that was booming, they would have sold off to, to one of those developers, but you know, they're, they're just holding on. And I think they're, they look at it like a long-term savings account or, right. you know, something they could pass down to their family for, for future generations of wealth. Well, there's that common saying, uh, God's not making any more land and land only goes up in value, which both are theoretically false because God would be making more land every time a volcano erupts that does create more land <laughs> if we're going philosophical. Uh, but, and then land prices do drop. We saw that after 2008, they dropped significantly. Normally land gets hit harder than housing because less people are buying it because the market just fell apart and who wants to go build during a, a recession or a depression. Yeah, and, and I know I'm an East Coast boy, right? So New Jersey, small ass state, most highly dense, densely populated state. Right. So. When I was out there, I'm like, yeah, land's valuable. There's like not that much land left. Mm -hmm. Moved out to Arizona and you leave Maricopa County, there's land everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. right? So I always wonder like, you know, trying to project way down the road, like is this land in the middle of Arizona, is it really that valuable? Like, could it be almost useless? Like I, I have a hard time projecting, I think long-term uh, when you think about probably 200 years ago the pioneers coming out here right, right? whoever bought like 100 acres in paradise valley did really well but some right. other dude probably owned some land three hours north that yeah, nothing that ended up doing nothing so do you think it's just kind of a guessing game in the future if you're owning land like in super rural areas or are there things you should be looking out for so the rural stuff can be difficult because it's highly speculative you know what i mean you are banking that the city's path of progress is going to keep moving that way and we've seen very often things change. So I know people that back in, uh, what was this, 2006, were buying land in Casa Grande because they were gonna put the new Six Flags water park out there. Yeah. So they bought all the land around it they could, it never happened. So they sat on that land till now, it's just now getting back to the price that they paid for it. So I mean, hold land for 20 years to make no money is not a great investment strategy. <laughs> yeah. Same thing happened with Bill Gates' City of the uh, Future out in Buckeye. Oh yeah, he wants to build like that new tech city, like built on a grid. And I, I right. don't know, dude. I don't. I don't really trust Bill Gates, so I'm not moving to that shit. But yeah, no, he was supposed to do that back in 2008 as well, and it's still sitting there. And a lot of people rushed to buy all the land around him, and they still haven't gotten their money back out yet. So yeah. So it's, it's risk involved, like, like anything else kind of in Absolutely. real estate. Do you mostly, are, are you sticking to uh, land that is meant for residential building yeah. or do you also purchase land that's meant for like commercial and other uses? Uh, so moving into the commercial stuff a little more, looking at some like warehouse builds and stuff like that, but mainly we're doing the residential, small infill lots in town, especially lots for multi or for mobile homes. Uh, mobile home prices are starting to come down. So I'm gonna start buying lots dropping mobile homes and doing that to make a quick profit. Yeah, that seems interesting. I know for, for me, like what I'm seeing, 
like right over here, this part of town, obviously, and I don't think I ever really fully recognized it, but like cities have plans for like what part of the city they want certain things built, right? right. So like this part of the city is is very clearly like industrial. Mm -hmm. And I see like, dude, these like massive warehouses are going up like all around here, right? right. And I'm just thinking, I'm like, there's still more plots of land. I know in the next three years, like one of those big old warehouses are gonna be built. right? And I just think there, there could be a lot of money to be made if you could just kind of arbitrage and, and figure out, you know, kind of find a, a pretty good deal on it. It's just like you're dealing with a lot of zeros on these big ass deals. Yeah. Like how, how would you maybe take advantage of that knowing that at some point in the next few years, that lot, it's gonna have a big commercial building or, or like are things already in the works possibly? So a lot of those big lots, you have giant um, REITs and hedge funds and these big outfits, they come in and land bank. So as soon as they see a path of progress, they'll come buy a thousand acres at a crazy high price and just sit on it. There's a few big names out here that own majority of the stuff on the west side, and then they slowly sell it off with brokers at you know top dollar to uh, end users. So yeah. you're competing against some big fish in the commercial realm that have the backing, that have the credibility, that have all these things that you have to overcome. So there's some opportunity there, but you got to be on your game. Yeah, it seems it seems kind of tough. And I guess I know we talked about it a little bit before, but also part of it is like building those relationships with the brokers. A lot of times mm -hmm. the brokers have the keys. Right. Are, are you focusing more on like building relationships with the brokers or are you kind of trying to go around them, find the actual owner and then try to negotiate from there? So brokers can be your best friend as soon as you prove to them that you have money and can do some deals. So I started working out with uh, Gunner with Leverose, amazing um, broker who's helped me sell actually some of my land deals. So I brought him in, I bought the land and then he was able to bring a buyer to the table and he's helping me source some deals. So yeah, brokers can be a huge asset to you if they're up to speed in the land game. Like he's very uh, affluent in the um, game of land and multifamily development. He knows the costs of it compared to some brokers that maybe they just sell multifamily so they're not gonna know the development side of things. So yeah, be careful what brokers you're talking to. And then also you're gonna have to prove that you're worth their time too. You know what I mean? It's not, yeah. we're interviewing them and they're interviewing us. Like, right. does this guy actually have money to buy? I'm not just gonna send him offers all day and then he's gonna get a deal and try to wholesale it. Like, show me you have the money to close on this first. I don't care what you do with it after, but do you have the money to buy it? Yeah, they, they wanna see that. They don't wanna be dealing with other middlemen. No, right. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, their sellers don't wanna deal with that shit either. Right. Where then their broker's job was to vet these people out and then it's like, oh, we went under contract with some 18 year old wholesaler that right, has <laughs> lives no money. in Virginia that has no money. Like, right. are you a shithead or something like that? Yeah, yeah. so it makes them look bad. You know, it looks like they didn't do their job of vetting the buyer. And that's why like, if we're going to brokers and we're gonna take a lot down either for entitlement or a small multifamily development, uh, proof of funds, show that we're going to take it down, show that we're going to pay for all the surveys and due diligence needed, show that we're getting a site plan. Like our contract very clearly outlines, these are the steps we're going to go through. And if we miss one of these steps, you can cancel the contract on the buy side. So yeah. we're getting in for the city for our pre-app. We're getting in for the uh, PAP meeting. We're getting in for you know the approvals. And if we miss any of these dates, you can cancel on us and we lose all the money that we put into the deal. Yeah, so giving them like, you know, pretty, I know even in our single family agreement, in the houses we buy in New Jersey, like our agreements are very much like favorable on like the seller side. Right. To just show like we're really serious. Like we'll put mm -hmm. down hard EMD, like right after we walk it, like no backing out. And we try to just do that to to instill the confidence in the right. seller that we're actual closers and we're gonna move forward with the deal. Right. Absolutely. And and this market it's tough too because a lot of wholesalers are going after these same lots. And I won't buy personally a site a lot sight unseen until I've gotten my due diligence. We I've gotten burned on two lots where I didn't do the due diligence, there's easements or some sort of issues on it. So I won't do it. And that too many wholesalers like, oh, we'll buy it sight unseen cash, you know what I mean? And we'll do a hard EMD right away. And I'm like, well, how did they actually put the EMD down? Well, actually they didn't deposit it. And I'm like, well, that's because they're wholesaling it. I'm not buying your lot unless I get an Ulta survey. I yeah. have to have that. A easement, uh, you mentioned that a couple of times, like explain to people wh what is that? And too many of them you said? Yeah, so an easement is, you know, a piece of the property that is deeded over to the government, to a utility provider, to a neighbor that you no longer can use. So there, or it could be like a wash easement, like where a river's running through your property. There could be an easement for that or a storm runoff. That could be an easement. There's a lot of these, uh, in AJ, there's called federal patent easements where the city wasn't sure where they're gonna build the roads. So they put easements in saying, you can use the land for the time being. If we ever wanna take it for a road, we can. 
Okay. So, so yeah. that, that killed us on one of the deals we bought out there because we thought it was a great lot. We're like, oh, we can put a mobile here. We go to the city, say, hey, we want to put a mobile here. They're like, no, you can't. You're, you you got to be uh, 10 feet off all these easements. I'm like, what easements? They pulled out their map and showed that the lot was basically useless. So, And you could, you could find these easements um, through the city? Uh, it's difficult to get it through the city. Normally, you're going to need a title report and then an Alta survey. And that's how we're we get around that now as we open escrow we uh, do get the title report and that'll say if there's any easements on it and then we send it off to a surveyor to go plot it out and so we can get a visual on it okay so similar to running title for single family to see if there's any other liens irs and stuff like that like right. the title company is doing similar stuff but they'll also come back with stuff to say if there's any easements on that that land absolutely and then you're going and then the next step is just hiring um, a survey company out there right yeah and uh, sellers don't realize but it costs me two grand every time we do a survey so it's not like we're just we have no risk in the deal i mean we're spending two grand to take a look at a property that we may not buy because there might be issues with yeah it. i mean we just spent I mean, a different level but we just spent 300 bucks today on uh an inspection right. on a deal because we're trying to get like a price drop and you know we it needed more work and she's out of state so we thought it was a good idea to do that right but yeah there's a chance like we might lose out on on a couple hundred bucks but i guess in land deals those surveys they're more extensive they're, they're right. going to be more pricey yeah and like on the bigger lot especially for the multifamily, on top of the alta then i'm doing a geotech or a soil report so i know what the soil conditions are and if it can house a 10 unit on top of it because if there's a terrible soil under there and i got a truck and a ton of soil that's going to change what i can pay for the lot you know, and then we also need a phase one environmental study to see was this ever used for storage of hazardous materials where they was there an auto shop here? Am I going to have contaminated soil that I have to deal with? So these are a yeah. lot of things that you have to take into consideration when doing land that most people don't know is even a part of it. Yeah. Like even in Jersey, uh, there's like underground oil tanks. Yeah. So even if if there's one on the property and the, the soil is contaminated, I mean, it could cost like like 20, 30 grand. And that's just a single family yeah. house, let alone if it's like if there's soil issues on this big ass plot of land mm -hmm. that that's probably a complete deal killer a lot of the times it, it really can be and a lot of people don't realize that and that's uh it's funny our last podcast we talked about creating clutter yeah and a, and a lot of people took that the wrong way and thought i was saying make up stuff to get a price reduction but when i say create clutter i'm saying find things that actually affect the value of the land and do a good job of showing it to the seller so that you can get it to a realistic price. I'm not saying lie to people and make up stuff like, oh yeah, your lot is sloped that way and it's gonna cost us $300,000 to fix. No, be honest and say, yeah, that elevation change does affect what we can pay. It's realistically around 24 grand. And when you throw out these numbers, you better have some backing for it. Yeah. You can reach out to a grading company, say how much is it gonna be to flatten this out? Because the seller might not be aware. They might not know that that slope is gonna cost cost 25 grand and that's just good things to help you get the number that's realistic for you as a builder or buyer or wholesaler yeah i mean i can't even imagine like i'm a full-time real estate investor i'm talking to super smart people on my podcast all the time right. right indulged in this info and if i got deeded just some land today right i wouldn't know all this shit really like right i would know probably more than the average joe but i mean these people that own probably a lot of these pieces of land i would assume that they're not all super in depth with knowing uh how much all these things cost and how much like grading could affect or bad soil and it's probably a lot of i would think a lot of educating that um, it's probably hard for them to also trust too right like mm -hmm. it's like when you're trying to educate a seller like hey i'm gonna have to replace the roof and this at least that's kind of like relatable that they, right. they've probably replaced the roof before or done this, mm -hmm. but you're talking to these people that, you know, they probably are just like, Oh, I own all this land in a good part of the city. It should be worth a lot. And then right. when you're bringing up all these little things, they're, they're probably looking at it. Like you're, you're just trying to get a really good deal off of them essentially. Right. Well, and then they, and they do, and they don't trust it. They're like, well, an agent said I could get 180. Okay. And I saw that you put it on market and it sat for eight months. And what was the highest offer you got? Well, I'm not telling you that. Okay, so we know it's not 180 because you was sold. <laughs> yeah. And I could do, are you interested in knowing why nobody probably paid you 180? I can tell you why, but you might not want to hear it. It's this, 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 and this. I mean, the slope, the elevation change, uh, you don't have utilities on the lot. You know, you have a utility easement cutting through with power lines overhead. This all affects what a builder can do. And that's the only way you can, you can try to show them that these are the issues that you're facing. And then at the end of the day, they have to decide if they trust you or not. And I recommend everybody be like, Go look it up, go do your own research. I'm gonna give you what I think is the issues. Feel free to take my word and 
verify it. Don't trust me. I'm a stranger on the phone. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 There's always that, that game, but at the same time, it's like, if, if they actually do go through and they're like, Oh shit, this guy knew all of his shit. Like he's right. probably a serious buyer because he did all that due diligence. He knew the right questions to ask. Right. Like he, he's probably actually serious about moving forward with this. So maybe that could sometimes spark negotiations again, but I can. it depends. Sometimes you have those tire kickers that they don't give a fuck what you're saying. <laughs> no, they don't. There's a guy we just spoke with yesterday in his lot. He wants 175,000 comps ready to build we're at 165 and he did have a pretty nasty slope so we'd have to fill it in to bring it up because it was pouring down into a wash he didn't have the utilities on his lot so i walked him through all the issues with his lot and i'm like what do you want to do he's like i want 175 like it's physically impossible for anyone to pay you that well that's what i want take it or leave it <laughs> all right well best of luck those people a lot of times they end up dying with the property and then their kids sell it for 50 cents on the dollar to you yep. so it's like i don't know it's very it, it's part of the game yep. but how would you say it, dude? I've been I've been talking to a lot of people like the last six seven months, pretty much since like June, mm -hmm. right? I, I talked to mostly on here like local guys around Arizona, but kind of nationwide, it seems like everyone's been struggling kind of oh, yeah. since like June. Yeah, um, I haven't talked to one person who sounds like they've been like super killing it. Right. Some guys like got crushed pretty bad flipping. Some guys are are doing pretty well. You know, kind of like navigated through the storm. How has like the land side of things uh, been, I guess, since the market shifted in June? So I was able to uh, still offload some properties at the end of the year. Q4 was a rougher one. It was, you know, things just weren't where it was because there was a lot of hesitancy. And moving into this year, there's a lot of hesitancy still. A lot of the single family guys stopped buying for the time being as they kind of see where, you know, the house levels are going to relate to or fall back to or level out at. But the multifamily guys seemed a little more interested in some of the larger lots. I see them going a little harder because now they can actually get land at a decent price again because yeah. they know there's, you know, some blood in the water. So a lot of the bigger multifamily buyers are coming back out. Yeah, I would think those bigger guys, um, they might, it, you know, they could just hedge more risk essentially. Right. So once they start seeing some prices go down, they, they probably want to jump on them. Well, yeah, especially since they think that labor and material should be coming down, especially since mm -hmm. the government's saying we need to get unemployment back up. So as unemployment comes up, people need jobs and labor and material should be start coming a little more cost effective for these builds. Yeah. Um, any any big pivots that you had to make within your business like during this time? Did you change up uh, your marketing, how, how your team was set up? Yeah, uh, some changes to the team. Um, one of the guys moved back to Detroit to be closer to family, which is, you know, it's an admirable thing to do. Can't knock somebody for wanting to be closer to family. Right. And uh, he's flipping houses out there and doing pretty good from what I hear. And then uh, another guy on my team, uh, he he finally stacked up enough money to go chase his dream of building up his YouTube channel and doing like a lot of the uh, in-person interviews like out in the street for like Instagram and TikTok, which is really cool to see. Oh, that's dope. I mean, 25, no better time to chase a dream than now. So it's cool to see that he was able to build that kind of liquidity over the few years working together and now he's out chasing that dream full force so that's pretty cool yeah what about um like like marketing side did you i, I know we we pulled back a lot of marketing just because th there was so much indecisiveness in from buyers and sellers right it's like you had sellers that weren't coming to the realization that like the market's changed mm -hmm. that buyers need to buy deeper um and then also though even if you did find a seller that you, you thought was a good deal then you had the buyers that even if it the numbers made sense they wanted to just wait on the sideline to see maybe they'll go down a little lower. Right. Um, so, so we pulled that marketing because it was just, even if we had a good lead, there might not be a buyer for it. It, it just didn't turn into a deal. Did right. you pull back some marketing? Uh, so yeah, we kind of slowed things down cause we were going, you know, six days a week, just nonstop. So that's when we kind of slowed everything down and started to restructure the team and figure out who was wanting to be here long term and who was kind of, you know, ready to move on to something else. And that's when the guys decided to go their route. And so I restructured, brought on some new guys and it's been more of a slow down and let's hyper focus on what we're really good at and then focus all of our attention on that. Cause we were starting to get off into other type of land that we had no part in being in like some big solar farms and stuff like that. It's like, <laughs> Hey, let's get back to our bread and butter of what we're good at. I focus down. Yeah. Cut back on a lot of marketing, the direct mail and stuff like that. Only super niche stuff goes out anymore. And just back to cold calling the basics, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what, that's what I said. Like too, um, I, I did a podcast like with Jer Jerry Norton. I was like, it, it really can't, comes down to like back to the basics. Yeah. You know, there, there's always going to be, all these different ways to find deals and way to like optimize. But dude, if, if you really want to get a fucking deal, like get on the phone, go drive the streets, yep. like go, go make some shit happen. There's no easy solution 
necessarily, but right. um, I'm sure it, it's probably similar to single family. I'm sure a lot of the competition's been weeded out. Probably these sellers aren't talking to as many folks as they were probably a year right. ago. Yeah. Oh, now the the sellers are getting some uh, reprieve from the constant onslaught of phone calls, but they're still unrealistic on the price. They still feel that their land is worth the height of the market. And it's like, hey, your land appreciated by 35 to 50% in the matter of a year and a half. Do you really feel that's a true evaluation? Or do you think we just saw the greatest bubble that we've seen since 07? Yep. And some aren't realistic yet, <laughs> but as things continue to go, I think we're gonna start seeing some realistic people start coming back to the market. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, I see, you know, obviously, you picked a niche in land. If you're like a new investor, like you were even talking about, it's easy to get that shiny object syndrome. Right. Uh, do you think it's good to focus on finding a niche? I know initially, like way back, like when I first met you, you were just, you know, you, someone who was like wholesaling in town, you were working with him, you guys were doing single family. Right. And then you kind of like, I, I think you almost just kind of found land and you were like, oh, this could make sense. This could be a good niche. But right. do you think someone brand new getting into it, should they go directly into a niche or is it better to just, you know, where most of us start, go find a single family house to buy. Yeah, it's I, it's a tough one because land is going to be a little more difficult. Like this bubble, we had the wind behind us and it was easy to sell anything, right? But now yeah. you are going to have to have the negotiation skills. So yeah, it, single family house, you have a lot more buyers normally when it comes to single, it could be someone that wants to live there forever, fix and flip, you know, someone that's going to sell it or rent it for a tenant. With land, you're selling to a builder or a speculator. That's about it. So yeah, knowing that your buyer pool is going to be less and it's going to be a little more competitive, you got to pick which lane you want to go. And it doesn't hurt to get some traction in like single family wholesale because the house is there, it's established and it can be a little easier to get that first deal done because it's a little bit of a simpler process. Yeah. And then if you want to check out land, you can give that a try too, or just jump in the water and see what's up. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, you like, you, you know, I, I think it depends to like, why are you deciding to get into a niche? Yeah, that's great. Point. Are you trying to get into a niche because you think it's going to be the easy route? Right. And if you do that, yeah, I think you're going to be mistaken. Like there's no easy route, like right. stop chasing the easy route. But also like, you know, sometimes like the way I look at it, I'm not a wholesaler. I'm not a flipper. I'm not a creative guy. I am like, whatever the market is giving me, I'm right. going to try to figure out a way to do it. And hopefully I have like all these tools on my belt to, to kind of go make it happen and not just, um, kind of stick to one thing. But do you feel like for you, like, are you trying to pretty much like stick to land and try to just figure out what's the best exit strategies what's the be best way to acquire these, but kind of stick in just land deals? So that, that brought me back to like when I started thinking back, how did I go from houses? And yeah, I stumbled on some land deals that made sense, but it was a little more intentional too. I was trying to figure out what do I want in life? And my goal is to hold, you know, 10,000 apartment doors eventually over time. And I either need to buy or build. So I started reverse engineering. Well, if I do want to do that, where do I need to be spending my time? It's not doing single family houses. I need to be either learning everything there is about multifamily or figuring out how to acquire the land. So that's why it re reverse, like if you want to hold 150 single family houses, you shouldn't be going after land. You should be going after single family. So you're seeing the best deals first. So I guess reverse engineering things back, or if you want to be in the commercial space, you shouldn't be going after residential homes or residential land. You should be going after commercial. So I guess reverse engineering where you want your life to go and then do the actions now that would get you there. Yeah. How, how did you figure out, because I'm still trying to figure out like where I want kind of like my end goal to be. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the more I learn, the more things like I don't really want to do or <laughs> like th there's no easy road to like this, like passive income that everyone when they're brand new and they get excited about real estate kind of first go to right. Oh, passive income. I'm going to not have to work and just make all this mailbox money every month. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah we both know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like real, real estate's a lot of work. Right. So I, I I've still like it. I feel like it's always changing down the road and keep getting kind of pushed off of where I want like the end goal to be. How mm -hmm. did you kind of, figure out, all right, yeah, I want 10,000 units. Uh, so watching a um, big fan of Grant Cardone and just what he's done with his life, he's kind of similar background as me, uh, started in his 30s, same time I started, and he built up, I think he's at, you know, probably significantly more units now, because I think he's at two to $3 billion evaluation, but that's what I saw the life he was living, and I said, that looks like the kind of life I would want, and then I just started 
copying what he was doing. Same with Ken McElroy and Ross McAllister at MC companies looked at what they did. And then I said, that's the life I want. So yeah, I, they were rich dad, rich dad, poor dad, rich dad, yeah. poor dad guys. Yeah. I read his book, Ken McElroy. He seems yeah. like a super smart guy. I know he's out here in Scottsdale or something. Yeah. Up in Scottsdale. I think their office is in Phoenix or might be Scottsdale. And then uh, his business partners down in Tucson, but I was looking at the life they created and started mirroring like, okay, what, what do I have to do to do what they did? And just started reverse engineering. And now I, I'm not smart. I'm not creating a new system. This is, I'm literally just copying other people's lives and trying to recreate it into something that yeah, I can build. No, no, it makes sense. I think that's a good way to do it. I used to be, you know, I, I used to be like a really big grant fan and recently, I don't know, man, I'm just like watching more videos and like some of the shit he says and just like, even, I don't know if you looked into it, but, but it looked like he was in a syndication deals, assigning deals. Yeah at a higher price and making like a few million in an assignment deal yeah. to then sell off uh, the deal to his fund at, that his investors are buying the deal with, which to me, yeah. I mean, dude, that sounds super fucked up. Like, I don't think you should be doing that at all. Yeah, it'd be like if we were business partners and you're like, Hey, I got this great deal for us to flip. And then I realize you assigned it to our company for a fat profit. Yeah. It's, yeah. It could so be a little I, iffy. I, I don't know, man. It's like a lot of my internet heroes I'm learning as I, I get older, I'm like, I don't know if I want to be like that guy. Like, I don't know if I could get to where I want to be like without selling my soul. Right. And I don't know, dude, it's just been something like when you mentioned him, it's been something I've been fighting and like, I'm like, I was such a grant guy and like 10 right. X and like, that's the life I want. And, and as I get older, I'm like, I don't know if I could like have this life without kind of, I don't know, with right. doing things like the right way. Well, that's, and that's why I lean more on, you know, MC companies and what they've built because they seem a lot more ethical and a lot more, you know, they treat their investors well, and there's a way to do it right. Grant's obviously the go-to because of the flash and like the he's, jets. And he's the, the ultimate yeah. marketer for sure, right? Yeah, like here's the bougie <laughs> life. And that's yeah. what everybody when they're broke looks at that bougie life like, I need all that. And you know, I've spent all the money on the shoes and the watches and I still wear my Apple watch and just regular shoes. You know, they just sit in my closet collecting dust. But when you realize that you can buy those things, they're not as much fun anymore. But it's just having the freedom in building a big company that could do great things is kind of my why. It's yeah. not so much about the money or the passive income. I'm really not worried about that. It's how big of a company can I build to create some of the, like the philanthropic stuff that I wanna do in this world. Cause I see a big niche for helping people that needs to be filled and not a lot of people seem to be doing it other than uh, my boy elon musk yeah Save, no not for Twitter. real or or it just you know pe people doing it like the right way there's nothing wrong with like making money and right. trying to like grow your businesses and stuff but you know there, there's also like this um you know there's desperate folks out there that mm -hmm. that want to change their life and they're they're easy to take advantage of so i think like Absolutely. you need people doing the right things like in, in powerful and influential positions and i think we're going through like a tough like like a weird time in society where like you shouldn't just do just because you see someone on the internet doesn't mean you should just believe every word that they say no never check p and l's show me a tax return give me some give me some hard data you know what i mean that's, that's, yeah that's why uh, on the claims that i've made you know on the videos on my um income and stuff i put up my tax returns i have no problem showing anybody because i'll be 100 percent percent authentic here's the gross number and this is what i kept i have no problem giving those numbers out to people because i want them to realize it's not as sexy as it sounds everybody throws out a gross number when i say i made 1.5 million last year you're like damn bro you crushed it well when you find out i got to keep you know four hundred thousand of it after everything was said and done you might have a different approach to it and maybe that day job that you're making 375 at doesn't seem so bad so it's yeah it's no, all perspective yeah yeah definitely i mean like people always just kind of want to show like all the flashy numbers and, right. and I get it too. It's uh, you know, at, at some point it's still like you, you make a million dollars from like working a corporate job and then you go out on your own from nothing. And like you, you do a million bucks, like we've both done in a year. It's, it is like inspiring. And I think it's uh, you know, it, it's something that uh, you prove to yourself, like you didn't need to get hired by this company to like right. go generate all that, that money and, and, and all the other lives that you've helped. Like you said, you know, you, you brought on employees, they're living out their dreams or like, being able to do the shit that they want. So right. I think there's, uh, you know, a lot of good that comes with that, but mm -hmm. it's not as like flashy as it always seems. It's right. a lot of hard work. It is. I mean, the thumbnails do better when it says how I made 1.5 million wholesaling land than, <laughs> hey, here's my true net, net, net number. You know what I mean? But, and so there is a game played. And like you said, it goes back to that society thing that everybody wants to flash and they want, you know, the big numbers, but reality is very different. And sometimes, 
slowing down and realizing the guy that said he made seven million last year was that gross or net? How much did he actually keep? And that's a very different thing. Like we we're talking yeah. net, uh, you know, your true net or um, your net worth earlier. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Even that it's, and I don't know how you feel about it, but like um, also how much cash do you have like on the side? How much is into like properties? Like you, right. you could have a high net worth, but you could be li like, like living paycheck to paycheck or like if yeah. that flip doesn't close or, oh dude, I can't pay off this, this credit card until that flip closes, right. but you have a net worth of like $2 million. But to me, it's like, there, it's a lot more into it than just, owning real estate. It's like, how are you managing your finances? Mm -hmm. Are you staying, you know, pretty conservative and like you have a, a, a lot of funds to be able to live your life and do your thing? Or right. are you sucked into just all these massive deals where maybe one day you'll be rich, but it's like, if you're struggling on a day-to-day -day basis and possibly, and almost every day on the, the brink of going bankrupt or a deal working out, it's like, to me, that's not why people want to become a millionaire or have a high net worth. It's, almost the opposite. You want to get to that point. So you don't have to worry about money on a day to day basis. That's back to just like, are you living the life you want? Are you happy? Cause you could grind your ass off in wholesale to make a million bucks. And maybe you have super low overhead and you don't pay your guys shit and you're able to keep 950,000 of it. Right. But are you happy? You know what I mean? At the end of the day, is it the life you truly want? Cause I know a lot of people that are just grinding nonstop and they do, they seem miserable. Yeah, I know there's so many different ways to do it. And like, like even like when I had a, a bigger team mm -hmm. and it was a, it was kind of at a bad time when the market was starting too, but like right. I was working so much harder with the team than without, than without. Yeah. And honestly, I don't like people always who, who say like they have these small operations, like, Oh, it's such a grind dude. answering some mail calls and like, you know, just finding a few good deals here and there. Like you don't have to do that many good deals if you're making, you know, 50, 75 K right. on just like an as is flip. Yeah. You don't have to do that many a year to, to be living a pretty good life. And it, it doesn't right. actually take up that much time. If, no. I, if I look yeah. at it, and you know, there's something beautiful about that. Cause some of the biggest development companies are pretty small outfits too. They run lean, they run mean, and they just hyper focus on the one thing. And there's no reason you can't do it with wholesale too, where you could, you could probably do it yourself with one badass VA, you know what I mean? Or just one other person, just send a ton of mail, have the VA cold calling. And then you just pick up the phone a few hours a day and close some deals and live a great life. Yeah. I think society has gotten pretty obsessed with like automation. And I think uh, like Elon, like is exposing how much just kind of like waste is in even like the tech land and you're seeing all these layoffs. Right. It's like, you don't need like 12 managers and 15 this and, and then no one's actually doing the fucking work or, right. you know, you, you have your bottom employees doing the most important work and that doesn't make a lot of sense either. You know, um, it's like ego hiring. Everybody wants a big ass office and a hundred <laughs> employees, but it's like, why is it truly that the company needs it? Or are you just hiring to look cool on, Hey, I've got a hundred employees in a giant office that's 14 stories tall. You know what I mean? So it's all back to, do I need it? And is it necessary to grow the business? Yeah. And I know some people like the challenge and impact and it's like, can't stay small. Gotta like, you know, impact as many lives. And I think there's some truth to that, but I think I, a lot of dudes do yeah. it for fucking ego it's for sure. 100%. <laughs> but yeah, the people that want to give back and promote and help and build like a cool area for people to collaborate. That's amazing. You know yeah. what I mean? But yeah, there's definitely some other people that just want to grow a big business to say, you know, that they're the big, big guy on top of the totem pole. But yeah, but you know, I don't know. I've, I, I've kind of, go back and forth both ways. Mm -hmm. And even like thinking about uh, like growth, how, how do you kind of look at that? Like, um, you know, being happy where you are, but also like wanting to keep doing more and, and, and pushing the needle forward. Like, do you struggle with that on, on a, on a daily basis of being happy with all you've accomplished? If you look back at your life three years ago, I'm sure where you're at today would be like a dream. Right. But do you, do you sometimes struggle though, you know, month to month, if you, if things aren't going the way that you plan on to kind of keep that perspective and not be too hard on yourself. And that's what uh, brings me um, so much joy and stuff is looking at where I've gotten. And sometimes you will lose track like January, right? We're supposed to have, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in assignments closing and it all fell apart and I'm all stressed out. Cause you know, spent, you know, 10 grand in overhead. Then I'm sitting there thinking like, almost like this life is amazing. One, I can afford to spend 10 grand in a month and it doesn't cause any issues in my life whatsoever. And then just looking around at the house I have, the things I have, the time that I've got to spend with in great people I've been able to meet along this journey. Yeah. It's sometimes you do have to pull your head out of your, out of the sand and look around and say, life's beautiful. This has been a hell of a run. And if it all comes to a halt, 
it was still a hell of a run. You know what I mean? I got to enjoy some things that most people never get to experience in life. And we're blessed to live in a great country that affords us this opportunity. So slowing down and saying, this is awesome is a good, but yeah, can't, can't get too focused on what you've done or else then you'll stop looking forward to where you're trying to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's a balance. I kind of like struggle with sometimes too. Mm -hmm. Like one day I want to just wake up and be like, fuck it. I'm going to just drop what I'm doing. I'm taking a year off. Yeah. I'm just going to go travel, shut off my phone, get off the internet. And then like a day later, I'll be like, I need to dominate the internet. I'm making 12 YouTube videos. I'm like, right. I, I did, we need to do more deals. So I think it's, uh, I think it's something all entrepreneurs kind of struggle with right. a little bit, but I think, um, yeah, I think having a network of people like us talking and, and talking to like-minded people definitely kind of helps you realize those are pretty normal things and kind of right. how to manage with that. I see you, um, at, you, you're a pretty good networker. I see you always like going to either a lot of events or like I saw you at uh, the sharks, like poker night with some yeah. big players and stuff like that. How do you decide how much value to put into things like that on a day-to-day -day basis? I wing a lot of it. That's my, uh, I wing a lot of what I do in life. But uh, if I can find a way to provide value to be around people that are either living the life I want or, you know, a couple of rungs high above me in life, then I've got to figure out, hey, how can I provide value here? And I would like to get around these people because they're going to help me push my goals and my boundaries. Because if you're hanging out with some high-level CEOs and you're not doing shit, they're not going to hang out with you. Yeah, that's true. But just getting able the honor to rub shoulders with people like Jesse Burrell and Zach Keeps and Ramon and getting to meet these guys and see how they think and how they handle objections changes your whole mindset because they're going through things that you never even thought of that you'd be dealing with. You know, Jesse's got 200 some employees now and just hearing like I was complaining about my tax bill to him this year. He was like, do you want to compare? I was like, uh, no, no. And it puts you back in yeah. perspective of, hey, well, everything you feel is, you know, huge in the world it really is pretty small problems compared to somebody else. And it's nice having that reflection that, you know, people that are doing so much better than you can give you back against your character. Like, hey, yeah, I know it seems terrible, but it could be a lot worse. And this is how I overcame it. And you will do it, too. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself? Uh, kind of like comparing yourself to to a you go over jesse's house he got the lambo and this crazy ass house and all this and do you ever find yourself kind of uh comparing yourself or, or do you feel like you do a pretty good job of not trying to do that oh at all times yeah it's, <laughs> it's always a competition like i have a pretty nice watch i went and bought myself a brightling right and i was all proud of myself and jesse goes and gets his you know eighty thousand dollar rolex gold, out. yeah, yeah like, show uh, me that one too he's like oh that's a nice <laughs> poor person watch obviously he's joking you know yeah. he, he, he's an amazing support for uh, everything i've done in life and but yeah it's just it's good to have that because it pushes you forward like i don't want to be the broke friend so i need to grind because <laughs> one you know the goal is to one day be like hey jesse that's a pretty cheap lambo you got there yeah yeah pull up in your <laughs> <laughs> exclusive <laughs> lambo or whatever you know you got yeah. the nicer model I, th I think all that stuff's good um mm -hmm. w without getting too carried away and right you know i I've talked about a lot, but even like, just like, I'm like the second Ricky in this office, you know, right. another one's younger than me. He's got more money than me, more <laughs> success. So it's like, I, I, I do want to, you know, like, Hey dude, life's long. You right. know, there's, there's a long competition and a lot of things could happen. I'm going to work hard towards it. But if you try to just be like, damn dude, I'm not doing what he's doing. I think that could kind of, you know, make yourself feel shittier than you need to on a daily basis. 100%. Anytime you're trying to compare yourself, like it's good to have motivation and like a drive. Like if I call you and you're like, oh yeah, we already did 2.2 million this year in wholesale, like in the yeah. assignment fees, I'm like, fuck, I'm at 1.5. I gotta, I gotta step my game up. Ricky's killing me. <laughs> so it's good to have the competition, but don't let it destroy, you know, your motivation. Like, like, oh, I'm 32 and there's 24 year olds crushing it. Who cares? Start where you're at. Get in, get around those people, find a way to either provide value or do something, inspire them in some way, get in that circle, learn what they can, and then grow from there. And Yeah, no, definitely. I think it's, I think it's something it's, it's important for everyone to kind of realize um, and, and, and think about, but if you, if you're going to level up, you got to level up your circle to, to a certain extent. Right. I'm not saying you should like throw all your old friends away, but you got to have some people in your life where you're like, oh damn, like. He's doing all that shit. And then if anything, you could at least look at that person and be like, is that the life that I want? Because right. if you never get the kind of the inside scoop and get close to these people and you're just watching on the internet, obviously you're going to want the life. But right. sometimes you get in the inside scoop and then, you know, you realize the pros and cons though of mm -hmm. what comes with that. So I think it gives you kind of good perspective and kind of create those circles. Kind of 
Changing notes though, dude. I see uh what you got this free course? <laughs> I see your fucking ad on Instagram. <laughs> the yeah. land course. Yeah. The land course. Yeah. Dude, that's a good that's a good ad, man. I like it. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's free. The yeah. number one comment I get is how how much does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I saw that. Yeah. Free course. So what what's kind of your uh, obviously, you know, you're not just trying to give you you're not Mother Teresa trying to give away uh all the info and knowledge right. so everyone could just copy your your business. Right. But I do know if you want to impact people, provide value, and I think you're a believer that it always comes in, in full circle. So yeah. what's kind of your plan with, with that whole land course? And So I had so many people reaching out saying, how do I get into the game, right? And originally it was going to be a paid course. And then I just was like, I, uh, why not just give it out for free? Because it's all the information I couldn't find when I got started. So everybody was hitting me up on Instagram. Well, how do I look at this lot? How do I do that? And I was like, let me just put like together... Uh, it, it still requires some work. Like you have to do some legwork on it, but it gives you all the basics of how do you get started with infill lots, which is where everyone should start with land because it's the easiest land to sell. So I, it literally walks you through, you know, zoning and how to find lots for free and how to skip trace people for free and do all that kind of stuff for free so that people can go get started. And then if they do have a deal, I don't have to ask them all these questions. They already know how to do it so that it helps more good deals get flown to me because you know, people have already done some of the legwork on it. And if people have questions, I don't have to spend hours trying to help every person. I can just say, go take the free course and then we can kind of go from there. Yeah. I, I'm sure a lot of your time gets bogged up too. Just people that don't know shit about land and they come across land and then they're like, Oh, Anthony's a land guy. Right. And then you have to like go through all that kind of underwriting process, which dude, right. I don't know about you, but through social media, I don't think it's really worth it, man. When people send me deals on social media, right to me there, there hasn't been really like a net gain there as far as just like a legitimate just someone dming me hey i have this property and then sending it to me i've like i don't think i've converted one of those deals it's been through right. someone i uh, reached out through like social media we like talked on the phone and then he's like oh dude I, and brought me a deal eventually but uh, i'm sure with land you could get caught up just doing a lot of underwriting on shit that probably makes no sense well, and that's uh, it's it's uh, like a lot of people first getting into land will just go on Zillow and find land for sale and then just try to send it to me. And then, you know, I have to because um, I try to get back to as many people as I can and respond. Then I start looking through and then I start seeing every one of these is active on Zillow. I'm like, hey, man, I I need to do some more legwork on it and know how to underwrite these a little more. I, I can't just be comp and land for you all day. I just don't have the time. So there's, yeah. there's a lot of people that do that or they go on, you know, Facebook marketplace and send me all the land there or <laughs> Craigslist. And I'm like, yeah. Hey guys, go to the course, try to understand how to comp these. And if it seems like it's a realistic number, I'm glad to help and we can partner on the deal and get it done. But I, you got to do some legwork. Cause if you send me five properties a day, just off, <laughs> yeah. off the same sites that everybody else is seeing, then it's probably not, not a good deal. So. Yeah. So now you, now you can at least respond like, Hey, I have this free course. It's take this yeah. and don't send me stuff that's going to, you know, where, where you should have did this and this, like right. do that first before you send it to me. Absolutely. So do a little, do a little legwork. And then you may even find out you don't need me with the legwork. You may be able to just go find a buyer and sell it off and not split a deal with me. Or if it's a yeah. bigger deal that requires a rezone and entitlement and you don't have say the hundred grand to put up to do that, then that's where I could provide value and I could come in and, you know, do the lot split with you or rezone and entitle the property and we could get it sold. Yeah. Do you, do you plan on maybe like building a community around it or doing anything kind of else with um, all these people that are interested in land? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably a, a lot of people. Have, uh, so I think we're at like 320 people that have completed the course so far, which is pretty oh, that's, cool. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. I mean, it's free. So it's <laughs> Hard to say no, but people that actually found some value and a lot of people have reached out afterwards saying, hey, do you have like a, a Discord or a Facebook group? So I'm going to get some of those up and then it'll be cool. Just people could pass deals around and then we can say, hey, this what you said in the course works great in this market. And someone might be like, hey, the number's too low in this market or too high in this market. So it'd be good to just get better informed on how land's moving throughout the country and kind of collaborate. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out too, like best way I want to, like not even just monetize like coaching mm -hmm. and stuff, but it's like, guys, we don't like do all this shit for just like the, the sake of our hearts. Like there's gotta right. be a, a equal value exchange, right? It's like, I'm doing all this value for the last two years. It's like at some point you want to figure out a way to 
you know, monetize it and, and get right. it back in full circle and get into deals. But I've been thinking like, um, I never pushed, like I built a flipping course and I never really push it. I, I think I made one story about it in like right. a year and a half. So I'm like, ah, I don't know about this. And I think we're entering into a, a time where information is kind of becoming like abundance and free mm -hmm. to a sense. So it's like, should you really be charging for information if pretty much all the information is already out there? Right. But I think we're heading into a time where, you know, you, you still need like actual, you get into a deal, like you need someone or a community to kind of go to, to help you in the weeds of something. Right. So I think it's like figuring out a way to, um, you know, provide that and maybe not monetizing so much on like information, but more monetizing on the back end of like JVing deals mm -hmm. and uh, creating whatever, like maybe finding money partners or you being a lender to someone on a deal and kind of yeah. creating like an ecosystem of that is kind of, I think where, where I'm heading towards. And it sounds like to you, you know, you're not trying to necessarily monetize the info, but right. trying to figure out a way to, you know, get a bunch of people that, um, to, to whether you fund the deal, you find someone to help sell the deal. Or if like, if they just take the course and they're, they're doing land deals, probably at some, somewhere down the road, they might like hit you up and be like, dude, you made me a shit ton of money. Like, here's just like a good deal just for right. kind of, you know, show me the game. Yeah. I'd love to see some success stories. I've already had people that are out taking action that were new to land and I love to see it. And so I'm hoping to see that. And people, uh, I, I think it's sometimes, especially when we get, when you're new to the industry, right? I, I felt the same way. You're so focused on your own life and like what you have going on. You're not really taking into account what the other person's going through. Cause every time I, w if I were to send you a house right now to comp, you're stopping whatever you're doing, running your business, helping your employees, doing whatever you have going on to now look at my deal. You yeah. know what I mean? And sometimes we forget that the people that we're reaching out to have other things that they have to do. Like I have a team of, uh, we're at like six people now that re rely on me to look at their deals and answer their questions and handle that. And on top of that, you're running the business, talking to the CPA cause it's tax season, doing all these things. And now you're taking time away from that to help someone. And it, I, I hate being like, Oh, I'm too busy, bro. But at the same time, it's like, please be, uh, appreciative or respectful of the time that I'm putting into trying to help you get this done. And I think that's something that we all forget. Like uh, if I were to call you, sometimes I yeah. may not think of that. Like, oh, I've got this deal. I need Ricky's help, but I should be thinking, am I interrupting his day? And I appreciate him for going out of his way to do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think like, I, I don't mind any time if someone sends me a deal. I'm, right. I'm appreciative that you at least did that. Mm -hmm. But if you send me an active Zillow listing, in New Jersey or something. Right. And I'm like, bro, off market only right. direct to seller that you're direct on, you know, 60% ARV, then, then shoot it to me and I'll right. help you however you need it. I, right. I could fund the deal. I could contract it myself, pay you out on the back end. I don't care. Like I'll, we'll figure out a way to do this deal. Mm -hmm. But it's like that same person then will send like another active listing or, right. you know, some other shit property. And it's like, you know, you've gotten 12 messages from this one person and they're not, they're not implementing any of the things that you're saying. That's right. when I'm like, bro, stop sending me messages or, or right. I'll even block you because it's just, it is, it, it could suck up like a lot of your time and you only have so much to give each day. And, you know, you want to be able to, to help the people that are doing the right things right. and, and looking at, you know, deals that actually do have potential. So I think it's a balance of like trying to, you know, not be a dick to people when, when you're messaging them back, right. but also everyone should be mindful of other people's times when they're, they're sending DMS. Right. We should all be respectful and be like, I, and I appreciate, like you said, to anybody sending me a deal, but at the same time, do the legwork up front, make sure it's a deal. And we've all been there, especially when you're new and you're just desperate to get a deal. And you're like, is this one a deal? Is that one a deal? And you don't know what to do. Try to do as much as you can go get as much information as you can. I made a free course on land for this and yeah. then, but it's crazy how many people, even with the free course, don't take it and then still try to send you like Zillow listings and stuff like that. It's like, Hey, let's really slow down. How am I going to provide value to the next person? You're like, well, I'm sending you a deal. That's how I provide value. It's not really a deal if it's not a deal, you know what I mean? Or you're <laughs> yeah. not direct or it's on market or it's a Zillow listing. Well, what price would I need to make lock this up to make sense? Like 50% of what it's at. Okay. Let me go try, you know? It's, yeah. yeah it, it's like someone sending, you know, Oh, it, it's on market, but the agents will take less. What would you buy for? I'm like, like a, like way less, like it's been on market a hundred days. I know I needed like way less than what it's on market for. And I'm right. sure this agent's been pitched like in that those hundred days, a bunch of times on way lower offers. Right. So it's like, I'm not going to take my time underwriting this deal. when I know the probability 
of an on-market deal for 100 days at a way super high price closing is so low mm -hmm. unless some random scenario just came up. Right. You know, so, but I feel bad for the, the new person as well just because it's, they're trying to change their life. They're trying to get out of their situation. Right. We've all been there. I mean, that's where I started and I bugged the shit out of Steve Trang until he said, hey, I'm not just going to keep giving you free information. Uh, you can come start doing my courses. So I did. I went to his like masterminds and seminars and I started paying for his time, which is one way you can get around it. If you want mentorship and private coaching, you can pay for it. You know what I mean? If the number makes sense, I will do it for you. Or you can go out and do it the hard way and gather all the information yourself and then do it that way. But that's what I did. I, in the beginning, I paid Steve Trang and then I kept bugging him while paying him. And he's like, you know what? You're just gonna have to join my team. You know what I mean? This <laughs> yeah. is gonna have to be like a two way street. So then I joined the team and, you know, found some deals and it was, it was a great thing. So you have a few different options when you're getting started. But one thing that you don't want to do is then potentially, you know, push people away by sending bad deal after bad deal and not trying to do people want to help people that help themselves. You know what I mean? Totally. Uh, like if I see you're grinding and getting after it and you just have like one question that's hemming you up, glad to, if I can fire back a five second reply, more than happy. But when people are like, hey, can we jump on an hour long call? I got 16 questions to ask you. It's like uh, that's taking me out of doing something in my business. And yeah, I'll do it. But there's going to be a monetary cost involved. Like, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, you right. know, um, especially if you're providing so much free value anyway, like you're not on there like marketing all this this shit nonstop. It's like, you're just right. trying to provide value. So I uh, love that. If people uh, want to download this course, like what do they, how do they get this free course? <laughs> Mavro academy.com. Uh, M A V R O academy.com. It's literally free um, for the time being. I might mark it up to free, free to free to free. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, dude, I, I, I love it, man. I think it's uh, I think you're going to see a wave of a lot of more like kind of almost like, people for a while didn't make free give the game away for free on YouTube. Right. And then everyone kind of did. Yeah. Once they start seeing that, I think you're going to kind of see the same with like uh, courses and stuff. But it's awesome that you like made one and you're doing that. And I, I think it's a great niche that even me, dude, I'm probably going to take it just so if I come across something, I could kind of save you some time too. Like right. I feel, I feel bad if I send you some shit and then you're like, nah, it's like shit. I'm like, God damn, I just wasted his time. But it, but it happens too. Like you guys on your team do the legwork, you know, you're asking about utilities, you're trying to figure out your direct to seller. You're giving me the pain points, why they want to sell, you know? So you guys are doing the legwork that makes it worth looking at. You know, like if I were to, I don't just send you a house and say, here, bro. And then you're like, <laughs> yeah, this just expired on market. What do they want for it? I don't know. What do you think I should offer? No, I'd be like, Hey, here's the pain points. This is why they want to sell. Here's the damage. You know, I think they would accept this range is what I kind of threw at them. You know, and that at least gives you something to start with. Yeah, no, nah, totally, man. Well, dude, thanks for uh, coming on today. Absolutely and appreciate you having me. Um, hopefully we could uh, get some deals done this year, dude. Absolutely. We're, we had one that was close, but we had one. That, yeah, it was pretty close, but we'll get one done here in, in 2023. Let's go.